produce it. Uh, I'm not sure she even remembers, but I actually first met uh, Evelyn, who I knew as Maxine, when she was an undergraduate at Spelman uh, and Georgia Tech together. And she was doing a tour of Bell Labs. Uh, and the person whose lab she was visiting introduced me to her and said, here's a really very extraordinary young woman. Uh, so I noted that and then uh, was pleased that she ended up coming to MIT and began her graduate work in my research group where she did some quite uh, uh, foundational and actually still well-cited pioneering research on melting in two dimensions along with me and uh, a physicist by the name of Paul Horn. Uh, un unfortunately for me, but fortunately for the rest of the world, uh, at some point she decided she wanted to do research that had more direct societal impact than uh, melting in two dimensions. And <laughs> issues. By the way, Koselitz and Thales got the Nobel Prize because of your subsequent experiments, right? So <laughs> anyway, uh, it all was not lost. Uh, but anyway, so then ended up uh, moving, uh, left MIT, went to Harvard, where she then got her PhD in uh, the history of science. Uh, she's currently the, pardon me for reading, the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science and Professor of Af African American Studies. And she's current chair of the Department of the History of Science at Harvard University. She's played a number of roles at Harvard. Uh, we heard, uh, those of you who uh, listened to uh, the Harris and Biden speeches, you heard that uh, Kamala is the first uh, female and first black vice president of the United States. Uh, Evelyn was the first female and first black dean of Harvard College. I consider the latter much more difficult to achieve than the former. So, so Kamala really is second in this hierarchy of uh, high achieving uh, female and, and uh, black uh, uh, public figures. Her current work focuses on the intersection of scientific, medical, and sociopolitical concepts of race in the United States. She's gotten an extraordinary number of honors, has done an extraordinary number of things. I'll pick out a couple. In 2010, she was appointed to Professor Barack Obama's, our president, pardon me, Barack Obama's Board of Advisors on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Coming from Spelman, she was, and being on the board of Spelman, she was absolutely an expert. And then in 2014, to the President's Advisory Committee on Excellence in Higher Education for African Americans. Um, in 2017, she was appointed to the Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine of the National Academies. Sadly, I rotated off the committee. It wasn't to escape you, Evelyn, just as you came on. I uh, was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so I'm really sad we didn't overlap on that committee, which is a very exciting committee. She's currently director of the Project on Race and Gender in Science and Medicine at the Hutchins Center for African uh, and African American research at Harvard. And in 2018, I noted with great pride, uh, Evelyn was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, Evelyn. And the title of her talk, by the way, is COVID-19, Pandemics, History, and Science. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Bob. I can't tell you um, how uh, happy I am to uh, be here tonight I, and to have the invitation from the department and from Bob, who I've known for so much of my life, who has been such a continuous, uh, incredible mentor to me through many different twists and turns of my career. But I've always been able to count on Bob for sage advice and his great wisdom in whatever I was up to at any given time. And so I, I was happy to, to, to accept this invitation from the department and from Bob, because um, it gives me an opportunity to talk to, to you all uh, about you know, uh, what has been at the center of my work right now. And um, I think is um, important for all of us, uh, particularly those of us who are in uh, scientific fields to consider the impact of the epidemic of uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 on uh, our society. So I'll talk to you about my work um, and, uh, and then I hope we have enough time to have conversation about uh, a wide number of, of, of issues related to uh, science and society. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Well, I think I've got this right now. 
as you do that, I should have mentioned, we'll, for simplicity, we'll do questions via the chat function. And okay. so just please enter them in chat. Uh, I'll try and do some filtering so that we don't uh, have too many of the same questions. And so I'll, I'll then act as a spokesperson in the, in the questions. Okay, that sounds good. So I wanna talk about COVID-19 pandemics in history and science. Um, so I want to just just to sort of locate myself as a historian of medicine uh, and public health. Um, and um, one of the things that we do in this area of work is we use epidemics, outbreaks of epidemic diseases as a kind of sampling device to analyze various societies. And one of the leading American historians of the study of disease, Charles Rosenberg noted that outbreaks of disease um, in a society can illuminate fundamental patterns of social value and institutional practice. But until the outbreak of HIV AIDS in the 1980s, historians and physicians and public health practitioners had become accustomed to, there wasn't much to say about outbreaks of, of, of infectious diseases anymore in the late 20th century, early 21st century, because we had grown accustomed to thinking that our modern society with our advanced biomedical scientific understandings of infectious diseases and how they're transmitted and the introduction of uh, rapid responses to them meant that uh, we were no longer subject to diseases like tuberculosis or cholera or smallpox, which had ravaged much of the world in the, in the, in the 19th century for sure, and even further back into the past. So when HIV AIDS emerged in the 1980s, it was a surprise, it was a surprise to everybody because it was unexpected. It had, of course, as you, many of you know, it had a significant impact on society, especially in social relations. And Rosenberg noted that uh, the brief history of AIDS illustrates both our continuing dependence on medicine for better or worse, and the way in which disease reflects and lays bare every aspect of the culture in which it occurs. That's why we call it a sampling device. It's a, it's a lens through which we can understand some very uh, important issues about um, various societies. Now pandemics, as we are in the midst of, uh, pandemics don't produce inequalities in societies. In fact, what they do is reveal them. And there are three crises that define this summer of 2020, and which I might note for historians of science and medicine, we have never been in more demand uh, for public commentary uh, in our field, which is sort of a small field, not a lot of people know about uh, history of science at large or even history of medicine and disease. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to talk to us because everybody wants to understand uh, what is going on and what it means. So there are three crises that define the summer of 2020. We had the worsening pandemic of COVID. We had escalating police violence against people of color. And we had demands for dis dismantling systemic racism in US institutions, including scientific ones. And all have disproportionately affected communities of color. So as an African-American uh, uh, historian, as a historian of African-American history, uh, and American science and medicine, this is a particularly uh, a notable moment. And while people on lockdown were able to, to, I think, see more about the issues related to systemic racism, they also, we've all been able to experience more about, as well, about the, extra, the, the extraneous failures in healthcare and public health, uh, which are much more numerous. And we see the ways in which the privatization of healthcare and the failed policy decisions by the US government have revealed these stark racial disparities in health. And that's what the virus has brought us to. So just briefly, for those of you who I'm sure you know, the coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, is currently defined as an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. Uh, most people infected with it uh, will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment. While many other people, not just older people, as I have noted here, but many other people, including an increasing number of children, are uh, experiencing, uh, and especially those with underlying other medical problems, 
are developing more serious uh, symptoms in, in, as a result of a COVID-19 infection and exposure. And, um, and we're now trying to understand what's happening. The COVID-19 virus spreads, as you know, primarily through droplets of, and, uh, and discharges from the nose when infected people cough or sneeze. Uh, so the two issues I wanna talk about this, this afternoon is the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African-American communities, because it tells us something about the history of American healthcare that's not really uh, been available to many people in this country, especially those who don't have uh, much uh, knowledge of American history or the history of medicine uh, and American healthcare. And then just one point I wanna make at the end about the ways in which this uh, pandemic has re brought renewed attention to systemic racism in US society, but in particular also US science. So impact of COVID-19 on Black and Latinx communities, this is what I work on. And what's been striking and not surprising for those of us who work on these histories, uh, my first book was about the history of diphtheria in New York City. Uh, in the 19th century, the disease diphtheria killed more children than any other disease, uh, more children under five than any other disease. There was no treatment for it. There was inadequate diagnosis. Nobody understood the symptoms very well. And it wasn't until advances in scientific medicine and bacteriology that brought about the control of diphtheria. And the person who worked most on that was Emil Bering, who won the first uh, Nobel Prize in medicine for um, that work. So what we have now, unfortunately, is that Black and Latino Americans are roughly two to three times more likely than their white counterparts, counterparts to contract the coronavirus roughly four times more likely to be hospitalized by it and nearly three times as likely to die from it. And the newest piece of this data that I am showing on this slide is the increasing numbers of children, which no one can quite explain yet. Um, and that's why the school's issues, opening of school issues are so problematic because we are at a moment of scientific and medical uncertainty. So keep that point in mind. Um, and also, um, doctors and scientists who track case counts and death tolls are really uniformly horrified by this disparity uh, of, of the impact on uh, Black and Latinx communities. And many wonder if the data uh, is not even, is an undercount, not even showing how much more people are infected than uh, we know about. But one person was willing to say that we are looking at a historic decim decimation of Hispanic communities in, in the United States. Um, not only are they dying at much higher rates, he noted, but they are also dying younger, which means we are losing working aged adults and parents of school aged school -age children. So a moment of scientific uncertainty. Uh, remember, we first started uh, really being able to engage with what this virus can do in the United States at the beginning of this year. So we're talking about our 11th month that's a very short time in terms of, as you all know, in terms of scientific research and what we can understand. So what I was trying to understand was, you know, why, what's happening? Why are African-American communities uh, and to, uh, to some extent other communities of color uh, being disproportionately impacted? And the, a number of explanations were provided. High rates of existing chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and obesity among this population greater likelihood of being uninsured and thus less access to healthcare, more exposure to the virus during the fact, due to the fact that many people in these communities hold more low wage jobs uh, in places where they can't protect themselves from exposure to the epidemic. And of course, decades of discrimination and distrust in the American, to, toward the American uh, healthcare system. Also, people offer examples saying that uh, black people were less susceptible to the virus because they were black or more susceptible to the virus because they were black and how race became a way of talking about the deep biological differences between races that many people believe um, exist. And then of course, there were people who talked about structural inequalities um, in health, wealth, housing, and education. So these points, one through six, are elements that have been raised 
about every outbreak of epidemic disease in US cities that I've studied from the 18th century to the present. These are the exact kind of answers that are always put forth about uh, why uh, certain communities have had a disproportionate impact of certain kinds of epidemic diseases from things like smallpox through tuberculosis, through the 1918 influenza and other major outbreaks. So the first question I had to ask was, how do we get here? And the roots of these disparities are deep. They are difficult to entangle. We know that chronic illnesses uh, that have been named uh, might stem from a whole host of other kinds of issues like diet, uh, including lack of health insurance, which means people don't go to the doctor more regularly, but it doesn't quite explain why Black and Latino Americans are more likely to suffer from things like food insecurity or to be working in low paying jobs in the first place. But to answer those questions, sorry, you have to dig deeper. Uh, you have to look, in the, look at housing, immigration, education, labor policies, uh, that date in some cases to the actual founding of the Republic. And as uh, noted on the slide, uh, one person noted and many people concur that the ultimate driver is perhaps systemic racism. Again, then for me, looking at this, history matters. We have, to ha we have to understand how we got here by really looking back before we can look forward. What, um, what happened at the end of slavery? We have to continue to analyze the failures of reconstruction that ended in the 1870s. We have to deconstruct differences about races and the ways in which we define race, how we categorize race, how we understand differences between races and that concept itself. But we do know that um, these theories of racial differences provide a naturalistic explanation for restricting African-Americans access to jobs and education and many other things. And then we also have to look at how public health practices were focused on keeping white populations separate from black populations and what that actually meant. So I'm not gonna spend, I can't tell you, I can't do a romp through American history from 1619 to the present. So I'll just say a few things that you can see on this slide though they're very, it's a very uh, dense slide. Uh, of course, African-Americans who were brought here and enslaved suffered a variety of miserable conditions, uh, both living and working conditions. Uh, there were common ailments that had to do with just the fact that they, they were bad, uh, poorly housed and badly fed. So there are a lot of uh, vitamin deficiency diseases that occur. And then many other diseases were, were, were also prevalent in the slave populations. That meant that the childhood death rate among slaves was twice that of white uh, infants um, and children. That's pretty much what you need to know. Secondly, we moved from the period of enslavement to the period of the Civil War. And the Civil War, like all wars, uh, gave rise to explosive epidemics and high mortality due to the inability of those who were enslaved, who were freed at the end of the Civil War, were able to secure food, shelter, uh, and which left since they couldn't achieve those things, they were left seriously ill and many of them died. In addition, at the end of the Civil War, which many people don't remember, is there was a devastating smallpox epidemic that raged throughout the South. Um, and um, many people died from that um, epidemic, uh, though it was sort of controlled to some extent among the white population, but it was completely uncontrolled among the newly free. And after the Civil War, in the absence of, 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 of land reform issues, the newly freed population of African-Americans were forced to depend on help from the federal government, the Freedmen's Bureau, for food, clothing, and shelter. Again, we think about this, the people, almost 4 million people who had been enslaved were now free. They had no access to housing, no access to land, no access to employment. It's a refugee population, many of them following the Union Army at the end of the Civil War, right? So it, there's no reason to, there's no, uh, it, it's not surprising that they were suffering uh, severely. But we also know, as my colleague Jim Downs notes, that what happened was the greatest biological catastrophe of the 19th century. 
These ep epidemics followed epidemics of cholera, of yellow fever, and other disease, which just flow through this population in ways that are really hard to con contemplate. And after the war, the public health response, especially by many white Southerners in the, involved in the US government, was that, well, it must mean that slavery wasn't so bad because now black people are dying from all these diseases, but at least under slavery, they had houses and they had food and they had good treatment, um, which of course, uh, at this point, they couldn't provide any of that for themselves. And many predicted that the black race would die out, that by 2000, there would be no longer, there would be no black people in the United States. Uh, an interesting and disturbing notion of the ways in which this extinction the thesis played itself out. But we know that the overall mortality was very, very high at this moment as we we're approaching the, in the end of the 19th century into the 20th. The prevailing view among the experts who studied this was that Negroes, which is the term they use for black people at this point, Negroes died because they were inferior, they were inferior because they died. And so there was nothing for anybody to do. So by the beginning of the 20th century, the problem had worsened. African Americans access to land ownership, to economic opportunity, to education was, was and, and housing was pretty limited. And housing segregation, poverty, limited access to, to healthcare, that is to hospitals and clinics and medical education. And the public health response was just focused on, let's keep the black people away from the white people. If we keep the black people who are full of disease, and are dangerous because they're contagious away from the white people who are not, then we don't have to worry about them. But you can't do that. And that separation was uh, uh, incomplete, inefficient, and of course did not work. And it, of course produced a great deal of suffering from African-Americans. African-Americans of course did not accept this situation uncritically. Many of them, as we now had a generation of Af African-Americans who had been well-educated, and one of the best educated at this time is W.E.B. Du Bois, who's uh, um, earned the first PhD in uh, sociology from Harvard and created um, and generated a huge amount of scientific studies of the situation that African-Americans face. This one, uh, which you see on the slide, The Health and Physique of the Negro American, which was published in uh, 1906, was the first scientific study of the, uh, to approach what was happening with respect to health problems for African-Americans. Um, he looked at everything and what he found was that there were studies on every possible body part. People looked at the Negro nose, the Negro ear, the Negro eye, the Negro foot, the Negro leg, the Negro arm, the different diseases that Negroes had supposedly that white people didn't have. And it was just this compendium that he found the evidence was based on purely on uncritical observations made by white physicians and basically could not be sustained under serious scrutiny. And his conclusion was, we're not talking about a race that's gonna die away. We're talking about if you could improve sanitation, if you can improve education, if you can improve economic opportunities, then the mortality rate is probably gonna fall until it becomes something that would be considered norm. Uh, he was one of the most, of the earliest and most detailed, he provided the earliest and most detailed discussions of the health status of African Americans. Um, while others would continue to argue that it was because African Americans were an inferior race. Of course, in Jim Crow, this, this problem worsened. Uh, African Americans continue to have limited economic opportunities. Uh, and the pub focus of public health was all about keeping these groups separate. By the 19, 50s. So we started, my last point was about the 1900s. By the 1950s, still much of the healthcare of African Americans in the South was provided by just a small number of Black physicians and by midwives. There's one midwife who's documented to providing healthcare for over 10,000 people in the state of Alabama. And between World War II and the late 1970s, few of the benefits of the now increasingly modern, sophisticated, technical American healthcare system uh, did not, uh, the, the services that that new system was providing were not provided to African-Americans and poor whites who needed the help the most. And, and this is one of my most disturbing moments for me when I uh, read my colleague Edward Beersling's book 
and he titled it A History of Neglect, uh, that by even in the 1980s in North Carolina, which was a very progressive Southern state, uh, they found that there were so much, uh, the disparities between uh, death rates between whites and blacks and suffering was, was, was very high. Uh, and he found that uh, black men and women perished at rates that were consistently and significantly higher than whites. A grim reminder, he said, that to a large proportion of black families in North Carolina and every other Southern state lived outside of every legal and social advance that our society had made in this century. The one I want to show you is a slide from PNAS of the National Academies that speaks to this issue. If you look at slide A, it shows you uh, uh, age-adjusted mortality. The light blue line is of Black folks, the dark blue line of whites. At no point between 1900 and 2020 do African Americans have a mortality rate equal to whites. It's always an excess. 1900 to 2020. The second slide is life expectancy. If you look at it again, 1900 to 2020, it's a log adjusted uh, uh, scale, as you can see. Um, the only time that life expectancy of whites was lower than that of African Americans had to do with was in 1918, which had to do with the 1918 influ influenza epidemic, where many, many more white men died because of the fact that many of them were in military uh, camps where social distancing was not possible and many more young white men died at that particular moment. That's the only moment when the life expectancy of whites went lower than that of, of, of African Americans. So let me turn to the fact that as a consequence, people have been studying the gap that you saw on, on, on the previous slide, four years. People have been studying health inequalities, health gaps or health disparities, disparities that continue to separate the life chances of white and people of color, especially African-Americans. And, and people keep pivoting, researchers and observers keep pivoting between the same kind of, 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 of answers that were given at the end of the Civil War, that there's some kind of inherent biological difference between whites and blacks that we can't explain, or that the, the gap that we see has to do with underlying social conditions and uh, comorbidities. This is the debate that observers in this work have been dealing with for many, many years. But we know that racist policies continue, continually deepen this disparity and that we still have overcrowded and sub substandard housing, inability to transfer wealth between, between generations, poor education in many cases and medical care, medical care, sorry. And it's racism, it's not race that makes the difference. So COVID-19 has only revealed what was already there. And it's made clear the connection between poverty and public health. And we still see the effects of employment issues, the ways in which people can't practice social distancing, uh, that e economic inequality is linked to health inequality. And therefore, we have to deal with the structures that keep those inequalities in place. So, you know, my argument is that we have to address systemic racism as part of the mandate of medicine and public health. And this historical perspective, as I've just ran you through hundreds of years, um, can tell us where we've been and how we fail to incorporate lessons from the past in what we do in the present. And my colleague, um, Jack Geiger wrote many years ago, it, uh, we have to underscore, history is important because we have to underscore the extent to which racism, which has been this fluctuating thing in intensity, it shifts in content, but it still remains part of how we understand inequalities, particularly with respect to health. It's not just history. It's lessons that we can use to understand how structural racism actually works, and that's what my work is about. And then the last point I wanted to make is there's also, in this particular moment, what COVID has revealed uh, and put center stage uh -huh. And I know that, that Bob and other folks who are here, uh, Gabor as well, that uh, as a result, there have been many calls throughout many institutions in American life to end systemic racism, including calls to end systemic racism in STEM fields. 
And it, here's a pic, here's a graph from uh, the American Physical Society looking at underrepresented minorities uh, uh, percentages in physics. You can look at from 1998 to 2018, the data. But what's interesting to me is the way this data uh, is, is, is pretty flat and beginning to increase. But the PhD numbers are still remaining quite small, which means how is the field of physics going to change with PhD numbers that are not significantly increasing? So what's the answer? Uh, in September of this year, uh, scientists, uh, Paul Barber, Tyrone Hayes, Tracy Johnson, Letitia Martin, oh. joined by 10,234 signatories, became the largest number of scientists and engineers of color to call for the end of systemic racism in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's really and truly the largest numbers of people who have signed on and uh, to this uh, call and published, and then the report was, and then their call was published in Science Magazine. Uh, so this is an unusual moment. And I would argue that this moment happened in part because of the kinds of things that COVID has revealed. And they are, they, they, in their letter, they said, we urge the Academy to combat systemic racism in STEM and catalyze transformational change. So that's what I wanted to present to you this afternoon. And I'm happy to take uh, questions about uh, any and all of the um, material that I've presented. So thanks. Questions? By a chat. I think you stunned everyone, Evelyn. It's just <laughs> so shocking. It is shocking, that's for sure. That's for sure. But I think if I just want to add a little bit more about the last point, you know, um, a lot of people have been working on increasing uh, diversity in STEM fields, uh, and physics included, uh, for a long time. But when I saw this letter in science, and actually when I first got the email about it and I actually signed it myself, um, th that's, that's the largest number of, of people of color in scientific fields who've ever gone public to talk about this. That's unusual. Um, and I think it's significant. And I think that it means that um, this moment again has revealed and made possible the fact that some people are beginning to talk. If you, if you read, there've been letters and editorials and opinion pieces in science, in nature, in Scientific American and many other major scientific journals. And uh, it's not that there haven't ever been appeals to deal with these issues in those journals, but never with, I think, the certain kind of urgency that we experience today. Okay, so we have a question from Dan Stamper Kern, which is, uh, uh, what, what do we know about disparities in the impact of COVID-19 between different populations in foreign countries? Is there something you learned from this comparison? Yeah, so, I mean, so right now we're trying to, to, to look at that. Uh, part of the problem is the ways in which the data is connected from, uh, collected from different countries. So for example, in France, they don't do, uh, collect racial and ethnic uh, data. So you can't make uh, it's been very difficult to make comparisons between populations, though they've come, to, come under such um, scrutiny because they don't do that, that they are beginning to put some of that data out into the, the, into the uh, public um, scientific um, literature. And of course, what you see is high rates of COVID among North African populations that have immigrated to France. Um, in, in the UK, you see disparities between uh, around really organized um, in many respects around issues of class. So uh, not surprisingly as well, but also uh, England, uh, the UK is very complicated uh, in this regard. And so they are, in the UK for a while, there was a, a kind of movement to, uh, among 
people from individuals from the former colonies who are now in, uh, say, for example, the uh, on the on the continent in Europe in the UK, who call themselves black, whether they were South Asian or from the Caribbean or from South Af uh, from Africa, and so. That was again a category that's not comparable to the category that we use in the United States. So we're trying to compare in many respects, we find we're comparing apples and oranges and we have to do a lot of work to, dis to disaggregate the data appropriately, whether these data are being collected based on official uh, classifications uh, and then what those classification systems uh, align with the kind of classifications that we use. So it's hard to say, but, but the, at the end of the day, the poor, people working in uh, occupations where they're exposed to the virus are certainly, uh, the, and, and people who live in, in, in housing where they cannot de-densify are certainly uh, bearing the brunt of the outbreak. That's all going to get more fine-grained analysis going forward. Five years from now, we might be telling a totally different story, but this is what the story we can tell right now. So Gabor, whom you know well, uh, asked a question, which I'll add a little bit to. So uh, California and its voting pattern looks as if it's a liberal state, looks as if. Uh, and we had a true test of that in, through the propositions uh, just uh, this past week. And so uh, California is one of the states where uh, affirmative action is, uh, in, for any public position is forbidden. And mm -hmm. Uh, we were very hopeful that that could be reversed and so there was a that because of black lives matters and everything else right mm -hmm. that, that we made progress in that arena and so then the, the proposition to reverse prop 209 as it was known from 25 years ago appeared on the ballot called prop 16 and mm -hmm. then the consequence was that prop 16 went down much worse yeah surprise than than uh, prop 209 was voted in in the first place. In other words, so-called liberal California has voted for uh, overwhelmingly for continued racism in our state. Uh, yeah. And so Gabor asks the the quote unquote naive question of, you know, how are we going to make progress given you know what's just happened? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know this that was I mean I I know you you all who live there were surprised. Boy, I was surprised as well. I, I did not expect that outcome at all. But it tells us something that we need to understand uh, is how entrenched uh, and how much opposition and resistance there is to uh, addressing issues of systemic racism. The hopeful part, and I know many people in California are going to keep trying to address these issues in many, many ways. The second hopeful part is that the Congressional Black Caucus sent a letter to the National Academies arguing and asking for a new National Academy study to examine systemic racism in science. Um, at first, the Academy's response was kind of conservative. Well, that's, that's great, but we don't really have the money. The next day, a bunch of foundations and corporate entities said, we'll give you the money to do that because of course, this is, that's what this moment is. So they actually do have the money to do such a study. Now you have to figure out how to do such a study. What does it mean to do a study of systemic racism in American science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and including medicine as well? And that now has become the empirical question. How do you do it? So I think what happened in California has been devastating. But now, and now that it's on a national table, and I'm not saying that consensus reports or reports from the National Academy actually changed the world. But in this particular instance, for the National Academy to put out a report that actually examines this issue, evidence-based, will have an impact. And, um, and as I said, I'm not saying it'll change the world, but it will have an impact and I hope a positive one because I don't think it will bring to bear uh, on what many people have been trying to work on for many, many years in many parts of science within uh, professional societies, within uh, society, uh, professional groups like the AAAFs. And we're gonna get somewhere on this because those numbers I showed you in physics, there's gonna be, have to be something quite serious to move those numbers 
in a different direction and increase the percentage of underrepresented minorities in these fields. So my hope is, I'm sorry about what happened in California, and I, I hope those of you who are involved in those efforts will redouble your efforts, and I hope the new administration will be supportive. But I think uh, the fact that the academy, the national academies are going to take it on will be an important step. So that's, that's what I can say to a dismal result. So the next question is actually overlaps with the question you just answered, which is uh, uh, Kia Ak Ali Akbar just asked, if you can speak on the socio-political factors that were responsible for essentially for us not moving forward on racial equity in higher education. Uh, and does history show us what we should be doing? It sort of partly answered that. Yeah, so, you know, historians like to take this moment and say, oh, history, history is not a predictive science, so we shouldn't say anything about that. Um, no, I think the historical lessons are key. So um, if it's, and tomorrow I'll actually teach my uh, uh, first year graduate students in history of science. We are actually doing the couple of days on uh, the history of, of race in American science. So if you look around the early 20th century, uh, the numbers of African-Americans who were, who had earned a PhD in any scientific field was very, very low. We know that the first African-American man to earn a PhD in physics was Edward Boucher at Yale in the uh, 1870s. And the first African-American woman was in the 1970s, a hundred year difference. And then the, number, the numbers in between in, in that hundred year period are quite small. And we have to continually ask the question, what was in play that made that um, the expressed position of leaders of American science was that your race, your gender, your ethnicity should have no bearing on your advancement in science if you were talented. But of course, that's not how the story actually played itself out. That those factors actually did play a role and they played a role in complicated ways that we're still, historians, we're still trying to understand. Um, so part of it is, which I'll be talking about tomorrow in my class, is the ways in which historically black colleges in the early part of the development of the American scientific uh, infrastructure, uh, historically black colleges were the places where most African-Americans were educated. And, the, and it was a decision made by those at the top from the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution, the National, not the National Science, Science Foundation, but certainly Social Science Research and the National Research Council, that historically black colleges should not become research universities. They should be teaching institutions. They should not because the Negro population needed good teachers in science, but they did not need to provide uh, a source of researchers in science. That was a decision they made. It's explicit in their materials. Many of us have looked at those materials. There's no hesitation about that. And so once that was decided, it was very difficult to turn it around to saying that the scientific workforce uh, in, in the United States needed to be more diverse. And part of that conversation didn't even start until the 1970s. So that's how we got here. But even at, in the 70s, with the advent of the first affirmative action uh, laws, started opening the doors. But still deeply, but, but it didn't, those doors being opened by legal policies didn't really do a lot for the culture. So I think where we're at is a situation that has to do with cultural change. And that's hard. Yeah. That's it's really hard. So I think we, we are working on it. It's been a slow process. It's increasing. And uh, all of our scientific institutions and where there's leadership. And uh, for me, uh, being elected to the National Academy, which I know for sure would not have happened without the support of, of Bob and many others who've been supportive of my career over the years means that they're not, they're people at the table like me who say, you know, we got to deal with this. It's, we just got, we, we have to deal with this. And how are we going to deal with it? And how are we going to make um, the fact that the, the contributions of everyone uh, who has the talent to do science uh, should be uh, rewarded and promoted. And that's where we are. <laughs>
So I'll ask, it's really a comment and then ask your response. I had a really peculiar experience myself uh, in the uh, 60s while I was a graduate student. I decided to take some time off of graduate school and uh, go and uh, teach at Benedict College and teach physics in South Carolina because Benedict and its sister school, Allen, were you know, where all of the students, the students, their st students were activists, they were sitting in. And I thought this would be a really interesting place to go. So while I was there, one of my students who I got close to on the weekend got, had an, uh, some kind of an incredible stomach inflammation, probably an ulcer. And right near Benedict College was a hospital. So he goes to the emergency room in the hospital. Of course, it was the 60s, it was South Carolina. So they had an emergency room for black people and an emergency room for white people. Yes. But it was on a Saturday. And so it turned out that the emergency room for black people was closed. Oh my goodness. That's literally true. And he was told to come back on Monday. So then he goes, tries to get into the emergency room for white people. And of course they throw him out, right? So he comes back to the school and extraordinarily distraught. Then a truly remarkable thing happened. Okay, he survived, but just barely. Uh, so if you want to talk about mortality rates of black people in the South, right? Great. The next, the very next weekend, by an incredible coincidence, one of my fellow teachers, who I was also very fond of, was a black woman from the Bahamas. Sure enough, she has a medical emergency. She goes to the hospital. She gets, discovers that the black emergency room is closed. So she goes to the white emergency room and they go to throw her out. Yes. Then she starts yelling at the top of her lungs. She was a very, you know, out, you know, outspoken uh, person. Then they realized she had a Bahamian accent. Wow. Not American. Yes. So then she tells me they had a conversation among the doctors and they decided that because she wasn't an American black, but a Bahamian black, they would actually treat her. And they did. Yeah. So how do you understand this? Oh. Well, <laughs> it's, it's so about it's, yeah. it's, it's, Story. Part of my education. Right, it's a horrible story, and, and it wasn't unusual. So, uh, first generation Africans uh, who came, uh, uh, many Africans uh, from many parts of the continent who came to the U.S. in that period of time had the same kind of experience. They were, they said, "Well, I'm Nigerian, and I'm Ghanaian, and I'm from South Africa," and 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 in the South, they would say, "Oh, well, you're not one of our black people, so it's okay. We'll treat you." And then of course, some American black people figure some of that out and, and would fake it and say, I'm actually that too. And it, it really speaks to the structure of, of, of systemic racism in American medicine and the way it played itself out in the American South. And what, what happened is it was allowed to play itself out in that way because of the ways in which the notion of biological difference was so deeply embedded in the practice and theory of American medicine that goes back so far in ways that I can't even begin to alert you to uh, in, in the talk this evening. And so those were people who were not, the, the, so Africans are different than black Americans physiologically, intellectually, and socially by the rubrics uh, used by American medicine. So there were openings for these people to be treated fairly in ways that were closed for native born minorities. And that's just how they played it out. Uh, the federal government began to play a more serious role in these kinds of issues and at different moments, when they would play an activist role and say, this is not acceptable um, uh, treatment, um, things would change. And then when the federal government would retreat, then it would go back to some kind of crazy default norm that would disenfranchise all kinds of folks. So but doesn't, that, doesn't that imply that it's really cultural because the, the, the African, African descent is African descent. So you're, you, when you, you're okay with Bahamians, but not with South Carolinans, isn't that really cultural? The boy, it's not rational. It's not rational. So no, I know it's not rational, but it's all—it's also really, really cultural. I mean, systemic racism is a cultural phenomenon, right? Yeah, no, I think it's—I think it's largely cultural. I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the part—the part that I'm disturbed by is, uh, you know, I'm sitting on a committee now at Harvard Medical School where Harvard Medical is saying they are determined they're going to become an anti-racism institution. 
And they recognize that they are really going to have to go deep into many, many medical fields that they have been leaders in and ask certain kinds of questions, just, just like the kind we're talking about. And one good example of that is, so uh, 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 back in the late spring, uh, some people noticed uh, that people were presenting in emergency rooms who turned out to have COVID, who had a purple discoloration on their fingers and on their toes. Many African-Americans who presented with that were told they didn't have COVID, but many white Americans who presented with that were told they did have COVID. And so it turns out that recently uh, an African-American dermatologist said that, look, what happened is that in dermatology, they're all taught through looking at uh, outbreaks of various kinds of skin diseases on white bodies. They're not taught to look at brown bodies. And so they, they would say to brown, to pe pe and I use brown because I think it's really reflecting of the color. Um, they would say, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. And, and so brown and black people would have to really push, push, push to say, no, there's something wrong. This, can't you see the discoloration? Uh, and they would claim they couldn't see it. And so now uh, there's a very long article in the Times where uh, uh, an African-American female dermatologist who's writing a book and looking at all the ways in which the way you learn dermatology that you use uh, photography, that you understand the, what color, how color can distort what you actually see on the body, distort or, 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 or that, that the observers can't see through, uh, has shaped how people are treated for various diseases. So it's both cultural and it's about perception. Because if you have a tool that actually, and there are also discussions about these tools that measure, say, um, oxygen levels that are dependent upon uh, oxygen levels as uh, reflected through um, uh, uh, the light bouncing off of someone's skin. And brown skinned people seem to be given discordant readings than white people. So it is cultural, but it's also empirical, right? For those kinds of things uh, that get distorted. As long as those distortions happen in a frame where the view is we're looking at fundamentally different kinds of bodies uh, between uh, people who are black and brown and those who would characterize as white. So maybe we have a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to jump to one in the end. One of the one of our faculty uh, says that uh, ma many of his physics friends, unfortunately, uh, never still, in spite of everything that you've said, believe that the disparate income impact of COVID-19 is due to biological differences. He then points out that, which I think all of us here in California are fully aware of, we, have, we actually have a much larger Chicano yeah, Latino population than we do African American. And yeah. the data for the Chicano Latino populations, especially the inner city populations, are not very different from those of African Americans, uh, right? Nevertheless, physicists are supposed to be rational, still insist that there's something wrong with black people. Okay? Yeah. Uh, right. And and so then our, this faculty member says, uh, you know, it's, it's saying, other data that prove that there are no biological differences. So here's, a, here's, that, here's that issue, uh, of course, cuts to the heart of the matter. Um, so I, this is where I, I'm gonna say a couple of things. So this is where I stand. Are there, is there such a thing as variation, biological variation in the human species? And the answer is yes, yes. Why wouldn't there be? Right? Some of that's driven by geography, some of that's been driven by lifestyle, some of that's driven by a whole host of things, ancestry, yes. But the notion of race, um, uh, it, race is, puts a different lens on it because race means something different. But so biological differences, um, I can understand. And right now, many, many researchers are trying to get the best kind of data that we can begin to look at uh, epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists, what's biological, what's social, what's physiological, what's environmental, and what is, uh, you know, what Deborah's talking about, what's cultural. It's hard to do that. 
what's what has broken down right now making it impossible based on a host of issues that maybe some of you put various political persuasions would make arguments about we can't get the best data and that is a real problem uh, and so the answer to that question can you can you point me to data that prove that biological differences are not the cause is the answer right now is no we can't because we don't have good data and what I hope is happening with the new administration is that we're going to return to a point where we're trying as hard as we can to get the best possible data. CDC data is uploaded from the states. If the states don't do their jobs of collecting data that looks at uh, both um, biological issues and social determinants of, of disease, then we can't disaggregate and figure out what's biological, what's social, and, and, and what's uh, based on other things. And what happened in the last 20 years is that the, 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 the federal mandate to collect that data uh, appropriately, as many of us would say, fell apart. And so right now, we, we just can't answer that question. There are a huge number of, of projects right now that are trying to track the data, push various states, push the feds to, to, to support getting better data. We just don't have the answer. So I'm not, we can't make it up. Um, and none of us want to make it up. We want to have real data. And uh, I go back to what Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois said in 1906. At that point, people were arguing, observers were saying, high rates of tuberculosis among, among Black people. Black people are going to die out from tuberculosis. There's so much tuberculosis. But Du Bois uh, proved that there were high rates of tuberculosis among the Polish population, Polish immigrant population in Chicago that worked in the meatpacking district. And he said, so is it social conditions or is it race? And if it's race, show me how it's race. And I think that's still the question we have to consistently address. Uh, and, and we can use that there are fundamental biological differences without interrogation. I think we can't go forward without doing that anymore. And so that's where we are. There are many more questions, but I think it's already uh, well past the hour and it's also, uh, Ate something, right? I mean, uh, yes. Oh, so, so I, I think we'll we'll cut it off here. Maybe people can email you their questions. Absolutely. There are lots Absolutely. of really interesting Absolutely. questions. Absolutely. You can get uh, anybody you, uh, whose question didn't get answered. Just email me, and I'll forward you uh, Evelyn's email address at Harvard. Absolutely okay. happy to happy to have 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 your questions. Yeah. So thank you, and I hope once COVID's over, we'll manage to have lunch in Harvard Square again. Oh, I certainly hope so. And I, as we all hope for that, we are moving in a, in a positive direction and hope we can keep talking about these issues. So thank you very much for your-